Our scripture for today comes from Matthew, selected verses from the voice. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in the province of Judea. At the time when King Herod reigned, not long after Jesus was born, Magi, wise men or seers from the east, made their way from the east to Jerusalem. These wise men made inquiries. Where is this newborn who is the king of the Jews? When we were far away in the east, we saw his star, and we have followed its glistening gleam all this way to worship him. King Herod began to hear rumors of the wise men's quest, and he and all of his followers, followers in Jerusalem, were worried. Herod called the wise men to him, demanding to know the exact time the special star had appeared to them. Then Herod sent them to Bethlehem. Herod said, Go to Bethlehem and search high and low for this Savior child, and as soon as you know where he is, report it to me so that I may go and worship him. After the wise men left, a messenger of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. The messenger of the Lord said to Joseph, Get up, take the child and his mother and head to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you it is safe to leave. For Herod understands that Jesus threatens him and all he stands for. He is planning to search for the child and kill him. But you will be safe in Egypt. After a few months had passed, Herod realized he had been tricked. The wise men were not coming back. Herod, of course, was furious. He simply ordered that all the boys who lived in or near Bethlehem and were two years of age and younger to be killed. He knew the baby king was this age because of what the wise men had told him. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and living of these words. Two of Abby and Evan, of course, is the four weeks leading up to Christmas, a time of waiting and preparing for the arrival of the Creator of all things to be incarnated in a unique way in the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what's the story of the parents? Well, it has to start. I'm just getting started, so don't even worry about it. Like, this, this is not the story you're looking for. It belongs to someone else. Uh, I know the other thing you're thinking is, aren't we a little early to meet the, the Magi? And the answer is, you're right. We are. Usually we don't get to them until Epiphany, until sometime after the first of the year, but they don't show up in the story until later. But this year, uh, as we're following unlikely advent, and unlikely advent from uh, Reverend Rachel Billups to funding our, fueling our study and, uh, and informing what we do on Sunday mornings, she's asked us to consider some less prominent characters in the story. You may remember last week, we took a look at uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and the ways that these, if you'll forgive the outdated gender uh, expression, the way that every man kind of represents us. Represents those of us who feel like life has passed them by, have done everything right, and still our dreams, our hopes have not come to fruition including Zechariah and Elizabeth in the story we said is a way to show that everybody is part of the story of what God is doing in Jesus. And that, that God makes way where there seems to be no way and brings life to places that seem barren. Zechariah and Elizabeth don't ever show up in any of our activities, but they play an important role in the story. And today... She asks us to consider the villain. No, wait, that's a different episode. Consider the villain of the story. So it's really not the matter that we're focusing on, although they are a piece of the story. We're, we're thinking about Herod, the villain in this story in the Gospel according to Matthew. Have you ever noticed how important villains are to good storytelling? Why is that? Well, because, I mean, every story needs an every good story needs some sort of antagonist, but the good villains, the ones that, the ones that really engage us, add drama, 
aren't just speed bumps for the, for the hero to, to roll over, but add drama, add tension, add danger. And frankly, sometimes they're even more relatable than the hero who's often presented as perfect and has no issues. And I don't know, I, I have yet to meet anybody who feels like they're perfect and has no issues. So we tend, myself included, so we tend sometimes then to almost relate more to certain villains than even the heroes. We have plenty of famous villains that, that fill our stories. I thought maybe we could play a little game and see. I'll, I'll, I'll name a couple of attributes and see if you can come up with uh, who I have in mind. Okay, so for instance, let's say, well, one thing we know is that often villains have a broken heart or have experienced some sort of trauma that have led them down that path. So for instance, if we're thinking about the villain that, uh, well, she was traumatized when her sister was killed with a uh, housing accident, uh, who who uh, enjoys, likes monkeys, but I don't know how she stays hydrated because she really, really, really doesn't like water. Wicked Witch of the West. Wicked Witch of the West, of course, yes, exactly. Or perhaps there's a famous villain who's scarred all over, lost a, a pivotal battle because he did not have the higher ground, and was traumatized by the death of his mother and the separation from his wife. And of course, is known for his heavy breathing, right? Exactly. Darth Vader, sure, yes. Uh, for sure. Okay, how about this one? Um, tall, muscular, excellent horse rider, traumatized by the death of his father, who was assassinated with poison. All right, we'll come back to that one. Uh, we'll come back to that one. How about this? Uh, owns his own company, has more money than he knows what to do with, uh, seems inordinately enamored with people uh, in space, and is bald. <laughs> no, I was, I, I was thinking Lex Luthor would also accept Jess Bezos at that point. <laughs> Thinking like that. Really, you both work actually there. I'll leave that to you. Okay, how about, how about we'll go back to uh, we'll go back to the to the skilled horseman. How about this? Uh, by twenty seven, by the age of twenty seven, had been given uh, given his first rule to share with uh, with his brother under his father. Come on. <laughs> Maybe I don't know, but that's not who I have in mind. Uh, how about this? Let's see. Let's add some other. Let's add some other details. How about uh, was a fantastic strategist at war? Used a smaller crew and uh, won a battle, key, key battle, with a much smaller contingent because he was more strategic than the than the greater foe. Early on in his career, uh, later. When his brother was captured, his brother, his older brother, his beloved older brother, pitched himself out the window to his death so that he could not be used as collateral against this villain to whom we are trying to identify. Eventually, he made his way to Rome, where he was met by Octavian and Antony, and received his crown, his wreath, of, his wreath crown. Julius Caesar. Well, that's no Julius was dead by then. Uh, Herod. There's a lot we don't know about Herod, but there's a lot of his backstory that we do know. We that's known. We just haven't heard it very often. Friends, reading about reading up on Herod this week, I gotta tell you, there is a terrific movie to be made about the story of Herod. He grew up in a house with the, his dad was the wasn't the king, but he was the, the proconsul of, of the area of, the, uh, of Israel, and eventually got divided into him and his brother, and, and then there was like 
there is. There's brigands. He was excellent at police action against the brigands that were uh, raiding from all sides of their territory in Judah. He was fantastic at it because he was great with a bow. He was good with a sword. He was a faith. It, these are the kind of things that we know. He had super strong legs because that's how you had to. That's how you had to be a good horse rider. And then he used that skill on horseback to defeat many an enemy. He almost, like our best, like our most compelling villains, there's a piece of the story where you almost feel enamored of him. Right? Our best villains, I think our most compelling villains, our favorite villains are the ones that get a redemption arc. Right? Like Darth Vader, who essentially gets a what we might call in the church a, a deathbed confession. And 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 uh, and finds his way at the very end. Somebody from the studies as we talked about is Hannigan, uh, Hannigan from from Annie, who gets a redemption arc. The Grinch, of course, gets that redemption arc, and his heart grows what? Three times, Three times bigger. Or how about Scrooge? We love all those versions of him. My favorite is the Muppet version of Christmas Carol, but you know, to each their own. Like that story is so great in part because. Well, in part because uh, some ghosts scared the Dickens out of Scrooge. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And, uh, and he learns a different way. As my friend Craig Clark wrote this week, wouldn't it be great if some real world vi- villains were vi- uh, received some visitations by some, some ghosts and scared them, scared them straight? Isn't, wouldn't it be great if that's the way it worked for us today? Herod could have used the visitation of some ghosts, I think. Here's the thing. And he started off his career with great military victory, overcoming tragedy. At one point, was ready to kill himself when he had heard that soon after his father had been assassinated, soon after his brother had killed himself, his mother, he thought he heard that his mother had died. And his sword is raised, prepared to end his own life. When the troops said no, his troops said no, no. We need you. And so he did and he ended up winning that battle and, and finding his way to being king of the Jews. Where have we heard that title before? Herod takes for himself the title king of the Jews. <coughs> Unfortunately for Herod, his story doesn't end with him with military victory and, and, uh, and wise political maneuvering that gains him power and prestige. No, he ends up uh, descending into what we call descending into madness and, uh, and is sort of determining that, like many villains throughout history, everyone's out to get him. And so he executes at some point his favorite wife. He executes her brother. He executes the two sons he had by that wife that were his legitimate heirs. He, can't, he decides that there's conspiracies everywhere. And the truth is, historically, we don't know if that there was, we don't really have historical evidence that there was a, there was a slaughter of, of children two and under in Bethlehem in that time, around that time of Jesus, but it sure fits his character. It's absolutely the kind of thing he would do. He was willing to wipe out anybody that he decided was in his way. Other than perhaps learning a little something new about despised character, what is the point of considering the villain today? I heard this guy recently this way that when we, when we come to great pieces of art, whether it's a painting or a sculpture or music or literature, it kind of operates in three levels. Like on its face, it's what the art says, what the painting does for us, and what the story is. Story, and it's a tremendous, compelling story. Jesus is about to be born, and, and it's attractive. Outsiders coming from the east trying to find him. And right away they say, hey, where's the king of the Jews to be born? And who do we already know has taken that title, king of the Jews? Herod. How many things do you know like it when somebody else takes the title? Zero. Right? There's tension. 
in the story. There's horrific violence in the story. The story itself is compelling enough, but it also provides us a window. We think of that great art as a window, a window through the art into the time, into the culture, into the time and place, and the people that created it, or that it was created for. We know that Matthew's community, we're seeing Jesus, we saw the story of Jesus as resembling, as reflecting the story they knew of Moses. Matthew starts his gospel with, a, with everybody's favorite thing, somebody else's genealogy. Now, have you ever done, have, have you ever done, have you ever done one of those, like, uh, my ancestry or whatever the like the ancestry.com thing, like if you're looking into your genealogy, have you ever tried to share that with somebody else outside of your family? <laughs> I don't know about you, but my experience is nobody else cares. <laughs> Which is fine. Like they don't really need to. But that's how Matthew starts. Matthew starts with the genealogy. Like talk about, you know, you're supposed to start with a pension grabber, Matthew. But he takes us back to Abraham. And says, here's the story of the people of God is getting a new beginning in Jesus. And like Moses, who led his people out of Egypt into freedom, Jesus is going to end up in Egypt and come out of there and bring his people to freedom. We can learn a little bit about the culture of the, of the, and the times, the people of the, of the author. We can, we can read the story on its own. And friends, Great art also acts like a mirror. And we can see ourselves in the story. Now here's the part I'd rather, I'd rather skip. Because if we're going to consider the villain as a mirror, that means we have to think about ways and times and places that you and I and we have been the villain. We play the villain in someone else's story. I know I have, but I'd rather tell you about a story about someone else who I thought was a villain. Because that's more fun. I was in seminary and uh, <clears throat> had to do a paper on the book of Kings. Which I gotta tell you is not my most favorite subject. But I put, you know, like a dutiful student, I had uh, checked out like uh, six or eight books on first and second kings and uh, I did this paper and thank the Lord, eventually I got it done and it was time to return those books. And uh, the library at the time of the seminary was being combined with some other libraries, so things were moving and it was kind of chaotic. They had a box, a return box, a book return box, kind of outside the library. So me wanting to be done with these books as quickly as I can, could not take the extra five steps to go inside the library. No, I put them in the box. Fast forward a few months, it's time to register for the next class, the next semester, and there's a ding on my registration because the library has issues with you. <laughs> yes, friends, it's the curious case of the local librarian. So I had to go meet with our librarian, one Helen K. Minnelli. And she said, we've got these seven books that you have in that checked out and you never returned. And we can't replace them because they're ancient and, you know, expensive. And so we need like $800 from you. I said, uh, no. <laughs> and so for the next couple of years, like every single time I had to do something involving paying or registering, like this, this flag would come up and we would have this continual back and forth about, I turned into the books. It's like the old thing. <laughs> You must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. You must pay the rent. <laughs> you must turn in the books. I can't turn in the books. You must turn in the books. I already turned in the books. Like, it was this whole thing back and forth constantly. Meanwhile, so every time I was there, meanwhile I would see Dr. Manelli on campus, and I would absolutely love to go to her. I'd do everything I possibly could to avoid seeing her. On campus, I never took a class with her. She wasn't just a librarian; she taught class with her. I did absolutely everything I could to avoid her. Around that time, I moved into a new apartment in Wheaton. 
And one Sunday morning, I got into the elevator in our apartment to head down to the car, head down to the parking lot, the car in the church. And who's in the elevator waiting? <laughs> but Dr. Helen K. Minnelli. We lived in the same apartment building. My villain lived in my apartment building. She wasn't really a villain at all. She was just doing her job, and I was trying to find it. Eventually, we came to a solution, and, and they admitted that it was eventually admitted that they maybe possibly could have displaced some of the books in the big move, and, uh, and, and I agreed to pay a much reduced uh, fee to replace the books they could they couldn't find on the internet. But I tell you, friends, for the longest time, Dr. Mendelli was the villain in my story. Sometimes great art can act like a mirror. Consider the villain. When have you been the villain in the story? It was 1990. And we were, uh, it was the summer, so we were on a youth mission trip, and we were with an organization where they split up. The kids that we bring from our church don't get to be in a group with me. I get, uh, I get a signed group of, of other children from other youth groups, and, and we're given a project, and oh my gosh, it was a project that year, a nightmare, but that's a story for another day, and like, it doesn't matter. Like, it was, the project was a nightmare, it was a tough week, uh, but we had good experiences just driving in the van from place to place trying to help some folks out. Well, there was one particular young lady. She was a 16-year-old from Missouri who was in my crew. And as happens, some of the best parts, as you know, about these trips are the conversations that you have while you're working or while you're driving. Like some of the best conversations you have with kids when you're driving because you don't have to look at them. <laughs> Am I right? And so we'd talk about anything and everything, and there was another boy in the, in the group who would, you know, who would ask me about, I don't know, TV shows that we watched, and so we, uh, we talked about The Simpsons, and, or we talked about how one kid asked about, well, how do you, how do you reconcile science and, and faith? And of course, it's a, there's nothing to reconcile, they're not at odds with one another. Science talks about how things happen, and, and text and faith talk about why things happen. There's, there's no reason for those to be at odds, and, and the last day, Girl called her Jenny from Missouri. Came over with her youth pastor to find me to say, You know, Pastor Dave, I don't think you understand just what sort of influence you have on people that you're around. You must be much more careful about admitting the kinds of things that you watch and the kinds of things that you believe because you're leading people to hell. story or what was going on with her, but clearly she needed me to be a villain that day. How have you been the villain in someone else's stories? Uh, that's a question I think we all need to ask ourselves and be prepared for this story. The beautiful thing about including Herod, tall, handsome, well-muscular, psychopathic Herod in this story is to remind us that even when we have been the villain, we're included in God's story. That God finds ways to make use even of the villain. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you know, excuses. I'm not saying, like, wants the villainy, but God's love is so scandalous. So never-ending that not even villainy can stop it. So friends, when you and I and we have played the villain through the things that we have said or the things that we have left unsaid, when we have played the villain through our actions or through actions we should have but did not take, hear the scandalous love of God that's big enough to include even us. But then I believe also calls us to
to find a way to reach even the one we see as the one. That's the love of God that we meet in Jesus. That's 